Hello, I am Alicia Hall Campbell, Executive Director of the Institute of Child Nutrition. Over the years, child nutrition operators have shared a desire to hear district success stories and how directors navigate operational challenges. Well, it's finally here. The Institute of Child Nutrition is pleased to launch the Child Nutrition On Demand video series, which brings together child nutrition professionals to share their experiences while providing an educational and actionable outcome. Our team has worked diligently to pull together some amazing success stories. These videos are accessible on demand and highlight strategies and practices that can be incorporated within your operations. Check them out and we would love to feature your success story in a future video. Thank you, Dr. Hall Campbell. My name is Patrick Butler and I'm an education and training specialist here at the Institute of Child Nutrition. And today I'm joined by Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Dixon. I'm an education and training specialist as well. And we are very excited to have you here with us. Liz, can you believe that over a year ago, we began laying the foundation for this project and here we are. It has been a long road, but we are excited to share ICN's latest innovation and training. During today's premiere, you will have the first look at ICN's new training experience. As a first of its kind, the Child Nutrition On Demand video series allows you to learn from child nutrition professionals throughout the nation. The directors will share their experiences and stories on topics ranging from financial management to customer experience. After each video, you will be able to complete an action plan to map out the future of your child nutrition program. Patrick, our five talented directors, and myself will be in the chat to share our experiences. Please feel free to share your reactions and experiences as well. We'd love to hear from you. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the show. show. Financial management and the way that it affects the school nutrition program, financial management will make you or break you. We feed thousands, millions of kids nationwide, thousands of kids in my district. And if you don't know your numbers, then you will fail. With those reimbursements that we receive, basically what financial management is for us in a school district um, we pay for our staff members, we pay to purchase new equipment, we pay for all supplies. And so you must budget accordingly, making sure that you are taking a look at your numbers constantly, not just monthly, but mid-year, sometimes daily. Um, it just really depends on what you're doing and what it is that you're needing to purchase within your district. Making sure that we take care of the kids and that we have the monies or the funds that we need to provide great quality meals to the students. Within financial management and the importance of it, you need to make sure that not only do you have the funds for um, benefits, um, salaries, but you also, again, need to make sure that when it's time to buy equipment, that you've looked at where you are and you are able to purchase that equipment. Financial management within school nutrition runs the program. If you're not ahead or aware of what your numbers are, then you're probably going to fail. Some financial challenges that we faced in the district is the rising cost of food, having to account for those, as well as the rise in labor costs. Um, with raises come more money, so those have been the main two for us. As far as uh, tips for new directors, finance is so important. You have to treat your program as if it's a business. You wanna make sure that your expenditures do not exceed your revenue. 
When I first started the district, we had some financial challenges. Um, I was charged with the responsibility of making sure that we were running financially sound. What I did was I first looked at labor costs and I analyzed each site to make sure that their meals per labor hours were in the correct range. What I realized was that we were overstaffed and we were spending a lot of money on labor, but we weren't bringing in enough to cover those costs. I also looked at food pricing and I set a budget for each site to make sure that they weren't going over those monthly allowances so that I could make sure that we weren't spending out more money than we were bringing in. Those two um, tasks really helped reduce our overall expenses in the program and it allowed us to um, make sure that we were operating soundly. We were able to overcome by analyzing our menu and building our menu around the, cost, the rising cost of food to make sure that our reimbursement rate is not higher than what we're actually spending on labor and food. We're also looking into ways to make sure that the staff work as efficiently as possible by monitoring meals per labor hours and making sure that each site is within the range that they're expected to be. What I saw was that we were using a lot of prepackaged items unnecessarily, not in the case of an emergency or field trips or things like that. So I encourage staff to actually make, for example, turkey sandwiches versus spending extra money to buy something that's already prepackaged. It definitely cut the cost overall of the menus um, probably by 10 or 20 percent. We currently had the labor to make scratch cooking available. So, for example, with the sandwiches, we encouraged them to make it versus buying prepackaged because we already had the labor. It didn't cost us more labor. Um, the, the employees was already there to prepare the foods that we needed. When looking at the food costs, we discovered that for breakfast items that were prepackaged, they were more expensive than just buying the items in bulk. So what we did, we modified the menu to reflect the bulk items because they were cheaper and that helped food costs as well. We also looked at popular items that the students liked and we saw or looked for something that was comparable to it. And if it was and it was cheaper, we went with that item versus the more expensive one. Just looking at the food costs overall and comparing your bulk items to your prepackaged definitely help us reduce costs overall for the program. I think you hear financial management as a new food service director and you think to yourself, I'm hoping I'm ready for all of this. Um, years ago, it was a state director that shared with me some really valuable advice. And his first thing was, you need to look at um, what are your expenses and what do you plan on having as an expense? And then more importantly, capitalize on your resources. What resources are out there that you already have at your fingertips that you could use when you're planning financial management or when you're looking at your financial plan? Our biggest financial plan and our biggest financial incentive that we looked at when we looked at our whole uh, operational structure was our menu. The menu was at the baseline for all of our finances that we did. So we looked at how do we put together a great menu that tastes great, but we need to look at great products that we could put in multiple places. It might be an entree on Tuesday and we can change the sauce, the whole grain that it goes with, and it's something different a following Thursday. So we looked at both of those things. We also looked at USDA foods. It's often, I hear school food service directors say all the time, USDA foods, I can't spend that much money or I don't know how to spend the money or how do I look at that? It is really a golden ticket for you to really look at great products through USDA, they could be direct shipped to you, or you could process them and come up with great menu items, all using USDA foods that financially help your bottom line, and they're great for your students. Food cost, how do you handle it, and where do you begin? I began calling the manufacturer, to be quite honest. I think often we have bids in place so we, we know we have products that are tested and they're student favorites, but we say often to a manufacturer on a bid or on a new bid cycle, is that the best price that you have? 
is there an approved equal that you could put on your bid? And someone might say, why would you have an approved equal? Just because you have one green bean or one strawberry and it's the best strawberry, you could have multiple vendors on a bid that are approved equals. Look at your menu, streamline your menu, make sure you're getting the best utilization of your food products on multiple days. Having all these different menu items or four and five different varieties, um, it's a lot of extra product, it's a lot of extra product that you're gonna have on the shelf that you might not be utilizing. And for inventory, it might get quite complex at the end. Lastly, really look at USDA foods. How do you look at your USDA foods and see there's rising prices going up on multiple items? Well, there might be a comparable USDA food that you could put on your menu right away and really have that bang for your buck coming from USDA foods and you won't be using that food um, product as a commercial product any longer, you'll just be using it. USDA processed or USDA foods direct. So there are just a, a few quick tips on how to really work with your manufacturers, work with your state director, look at those USDA foods and capitalize on that great food that you serve each and every day. Food costs are continuously on the rise, but how do you look at your USDA foods to be a supplement or something that you can add into your menu? You should have full utilization of all of your USDA foods. Don't leave money on the table. Really look at those vendors, look at what products are out there, work with your state director if you have to, and make sure full utilization of USDA foods is the perfect way to come to financial stability at the end of the day on your menu. I think it's so unfortunate that we have negative student account balances, but it's a reality and it's something that we're seeing in all of our school districts. In Anne Arundel County Public Schools, we do a great job of reaching out to those families. We text them, we phone call them, and it's an automated system that happens every night. So as their son or daughter comes through the line and they eat that great tasting, healthy school lunch, but they go into negative debt, it automatically goes into the student database and it goes directly home each and every night to say to the parent, it's okay, we fed your daughter today or we fed your son. However, you still owe that money back if you could pay back to the school cafeteria. If you need free school meals or if you need reduced school meals, please fill out a meal benefit application and we put the uh, website right for the application, right in the text messages. So we know for a parent that's really struggling and they may want to apply for free or reduced price meals, they can do so. And we just nudge them along until we see that they pay back school nutrition for the negative debt and we know their child ate that great meal that day. I think the biggest challenge for directors in today's work world is understanding that meals per man hour has to be managed. That means X number of meals per out equals one worker. And managing those, uh, I had to be expert on top of that. You don't need to walk into a kitchen and see 18 staff members and you're only feeding 350 children. That's an exaggeration, but in some cases it's not. So for that particular scenario, you need 2.5 workers. That's two full-time workers and a part-time worker that comes in and either does cashiering at lunch and then runs dish room after she's through with cashiering or et cetera. So being aware of meals per man hour is imperative to stay on top of that labor force. Uh, now, extenuating circumstances might mean you need extra man hours for certain situations. Let's say you were renovating a building and you had to take meals at four different places on campus. Well, you may have to bring some part-time help in because your full-time help's gonna prepare the meals. Then you have to have four or five cashiers out there. You have to divide and conquer where you may need those extra meal patterns, but then pull them back the minute you don't need it. And if you're feeding 1,500 kids in a site, you can get away with 10 full-time staff members and four part-time. Part-times, four hours. Full-time for us in our district was seven. Of course, we did things a little different in our district. We were in charge of everything. So that meant we not only prepared, prepped for the next day, we cleaned and sanitized everything. That was the dining room too. So you need to look at what your staff is being asked to do to staff adequately. And that's a high dollar item. 
on cost efficiency for a program. So you've got to know those meals per man hour. I'm going to go back to the menu system and making sure that you're putting healthy, nutritious meals out there that your students will eat. Offer versus serve and choices has helped our programs immensely with this. But making sure that the items that you're putting out are going to be picked up. And then what we refer to is batch preparation. If it's a heavy meal item that you're batch cooking from the back, you're not going to prep 12 pans in advance. You're going to prep, say, my ADP for this average daily participation for this meal item was four pans. I'm going in with three and a half pans with a half one sitting back here. You never know. Kids may change what they want to eat for the day. If you have three entrees and four or five vegetable choices, a salad and a sandwich tray to go, they may switch. So don't over-prepare, but stay on top of it. And then again, that person in the uh, dish room, resource room, coming back and saying, I don't know what's going on with this menu item today, but it's coming back through. So that's imperative. And I am a big cycle menu participant. When you have cycle menus and you get them down and your students like what you're putting out, your staff have learned how to prepare those recipes and they're good at it, it cuts down waste immensely, immensely. Because you know what you need to have in your cooler or freezer and the staff is used to preparing it. The more you do something, the better you get with it. So to me, that's a win-win. I, I, I really advocate that for cost effectiveness for a program. In Chesapeake, we are operating CEP, Community Eligibility Provision, in 20 of our 45 schools. And we are accepting free and reduced price meal applications in the, in the rest of the uh, 25 schools. In determining which schools would be CEP, we took into consideration a number of factors. In addition to having the option to group them together to come up with the best uh, individualized student percentage, we decided that we would get schools into a group that may not reach 40%, which is the cutoff or the normal percentage that you would consider for a CEP school. What we did is we found a couple of schools who were less than 40 and grouped them with schools that were above 65, 75% so that our claiming percentage for the meals that we claim each month would not be below 65, 70%. It's working and it's been a true blessing to our community. In addition to that, what many people have to also consider when um, deciding to become CEP schools is the impact upon the school division. In many school divisions, you have to understand that they are trying to group teachers and, the, and the, the finances or the funding for teachers are connected to schools that have a certain percentage of free and reduced price students. Initially in Chesapeake, when we started out, we started out with six schools that were CEP. We're now at 20. Part of that is the development of a concept that we use called win-win. Whenever we approach doing something, we try to find out what, the, what our other organizations or our other departments are doing that also use our information to make their decisions. We discovered that if we were to, in, uh, to, to deploy CEP in certain schools, it might impact teacher funding. So I came together with that department, the department of, that involved um, federal programs, and put together a PowerPoint presentation and showed them how it could be a win-win proposition to increase the number of schools that are CEP, and it is working. I would suggest that if you are interested in um, uh, making schools CEP within your division, that you understand the makeup of the division outside of school nutrition. For example, in Chesapeake, we were um, initially, we were only 38 to 40 percent free and reduced. We're now hovering between the 42 percentile um, now, and part of that involved being able to get with that department, that um, other department, which was the Department of um, Federal Programs, 
and talk about their needs and how they used our data to describe or to develop what they were doing for funding sources, et cetera. And that opened the door for us in school nutrition to understand how we could help them to make it a win-win proposition. And because of that, I think it's really, really benefited them as well. And so I think sitting down around the table is critical. And part of that is having a seat at the table. Because oftentimes, if you don't have a seat at the table, folk don't understand all of what your program can do or what options they can use to, to, for with your program until they know what you fully are capable of doing. In Chesapeake, I'm happy to report that we developed a process called Champions of Child Nutrition. Champions of Child Nutrition are local businesses, local um, churches, local fire depart the local fire department, and any other agency that included um, city employees, we got together and we talked about what our needs were. Uh, it was uh, an initiative that started prior to COVID, but gained initial st additional steam during COVID, where there were agencies who were willing to come and provide donations to pay off student debt. I believe that if you make your community aware of your needs and use it more than just to ask, use it to inform, use it to advocate, use it as an opportunity to describe what your program really is all about. Most folks still think that we're in the 40s with our program. Most people still operate under the pretense of us serving mystery meat to their children. Most folk in our division were still thinking we were using fryers to prepare french fries for our students. And when I told one parent that we hadn't had a fryer in a school, in our elementary schools for 13 years, her eyes literally popped. And then it became an opportunity to encourage her to be a champion for child nutrition. That lady also is one of our don who donates to help pay off student charges. That opportunity to get people together helped us to raise more than $50,000 to pay off student charges. I might also add, and I'm excited to inform, that we currently have an agency that just reached out to us who is also interested in getting a group of businesses to come together to address our student charges. I don't think I really need to explain what student charges look like given our current climate with changes in the um, uh, students now having to pay for meals based on their eligibility. Our student charges have skyrocketed to close to $100,000. That would be ominous for, the mo for most school nutrition directors. However, when you deploy something like Champions of Child Nutrition, you have hope that someone will help you. When it comes to financial management, I recommend that every director looks at labor and food costs because those two items will be the most expensive things that your program will have to afford for. So always look at those two items. Always check your meals per labor hours and also look at ways to cut costs, whether that be um, looking at your recipes and using fresh items or not using prepackaged foods because they cost more. You just have to really analyze your program and see what you can afford to cut out. Apply for as many grants as you can. Those grants will allow you to use that money for equipment replacements. If you're needing it for scratch cooking, it'll allow for you to purchase any type of transportation items you need if you are by chance delivering foods to other vendors or sites. And then it'll also account for anything such as a, a new menu item that you would like to use. I also found grants for that where it allowed me to buy the items, try it out and see that if it increased participation. So grants are always helpful. I think um, my time at Montgomery Public Schools has taught me, um, of course, the importance of budgeting. When I first got there, um, they didn't have set budgets for the site. And I knew that that would be an important aspect of making sure that I worked financially sound. So just learning how to do a budget, looking at the historical data, looking at what you've spent in the past, that definitely helped me and that's something that I learned. 
you might be experiencing you know, less reimbursement in the summer meals time. And you have to step back and look, where are the students in the summer? They're not in the schoolhouse. So the best way to really um, reach more students, increase your reimbursement, helping your financial picture, is to go where the students are. So look at your swim centers, look at um, creating a mobile meals. We created mobile meals many, many years ago, and it was in the summer, and it was exactly for that reason. During the school year, all the students are in the house and we're able to serve them all. We got to the summer and they were home. So we created um, school buses. We started with yellow school buses and we drove them right into those communities that we knew students were at. We would be able to serve them hot, uh, they get a breakfast or a hot lunch. And we were able to go from community to community just to be able to reach them where they were, increasing our reimbursement, therefore increasing our financial uh, stability at the end of the summer program. Financial management is so important to school nutrition professionals. When you start to look at your financial picture, start looking at your menu. It's an easy way to really have it streamlined, have it something that tastes great for the students, and fits your bottom line all at the same time. A great tip when you're looking at financial management is using full utilization of your USDA foods. USDA foods are so important to each of us operators, school nutrition professionals across the country. Log on, understand what USDA foods has to offer you, and you'll see the rewards at the end of the day. Finances matter, and you know why they matter? Because the more finances that we bring in in reimbursement means more students that we served. So when you're looking at your overall programming, make sure you serve breakfast wherever you can, lunch, dinner, summer meals, even CACFP and dinner meals. So make sure you're gonna maximize your participation by offering as many programs as you can to as many students that you can reach. Uh, the first tip that I would give a new director coming in would be understand your finances. Do you understand where your money comes from? Do you understand how you, you have access to it? A lot of school districts and I'm talking about administration, they don't understand the federal program. They don't understand how and where the money can be used and that that money is for that program and it is to be utilized within the program. Know what your money can be utilized for, not only staff, food, but with regards to repairs, maintenance, and et cetera. Be prepared to do, I always did an annual budget report to the school board every year they knew where every penny in the district went, how we utilized it, what I was forecasting for equipment expenditures, what I needed for perhaps new staff to come on board because we were growing. Understanding the basics of finances. This is something else that I did in our program. Every child nutrition manager took the ICN course, financial management. They were given a budget to run their site programs. So they understood the finances and we discussed it in managers meetings. Uh, okay, you're telling me you need four more carts and some more can racks. How's that measure out with our budget? What are we gonna have to do to make sure that we have the funds available to have that for your site? I made them own it. We were all part of a team. If we didn't all understand finances then it was a mute issue and it helped to cut down on waste. And they embraced it. They soon realized how intricate it was. I talked about equipment needs with them. We talked about raises because I had to go to the board and ask for that. It all comes back down to finances. So when you run our program as it should be, and it is a business and we should be very aware of taxpayers' money, we run it like a business, we make budgetary uh, visual what we want to be in three years, what needs to be repaired, what we need in each site. It's ownership and never being afraid to express that in an administrative meeting or in a board meeting. Learn as much as you can about school nutrition. Become as informed as you possibly can on key performance indicators. Know the business as best as possible because um, it's going to help you to determine where you are at a given moment. I, I would recommend that as a new director uh, and even as a, as a director with years of experience, 
constantly look for training opportunities on finances for school nutrition. Learn ways that you can empower your team because when you empower your team to include your, your managers or in my case in Chesapeake, school nutrition league workers, when they know uh, inventory is money, the prayer is that they will pay attention and they will be mindful of, of what uh, makes their program benefit and what makes their program operate in the black rather than operate in the red. In addition to that, I would simply say become, invest in yourself. Become a student of your program. It doesn't mean that you have to live in your office. It just means that what you consider your profession, you invest in yourself in it. Do as much as you can, learn as much as you can, ask questions. The, the most uh, important statement that I've ever heard is that there, aren't, there are no dumb questions. The, worst, the questions that could be considered dumb are the ones that you don't ask. And I encourage as a new director, ask questions. Get with your, your local budget department. Because in most cases, you have to live within the confines of your local school division's budget. Uh, you have to understand what role you play. Understand how your money comes in from reimbursement sources, whether it's an electronic deposit or whether it comes in in a different format. Learn how to balance your, 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 your program as best you can, uh, monthly if possible, but also learn how to balance at the end of the year. Know what you're paying for. Know whether you have certain things that you are asked to pay that are associated with indirect costs or other costs that may be associated with operating your program. In other words, I would suggest as a director, new, old, or otherwise, that you constantly become a student of the program from a budgetary perspective. Tips for success when it comes to financial management, go back from previous years and take a look at what you did previously See if there's any areas where you may need to decrease or increase um, your budget. Make sure that you are aware of what you've placed in that budget and just continuously to keep your eyes on your budget, knowing your numbers, knowing where you are in regards to equipment, in regards to your, your supplies, because you spend the majority of your money in your supplies and in your salaries. So make sure you are aware of what you're spending. Make sure that you um, plan a budget, follow your budget, take a look at previous years and, and see where you may need to increase or decrease in certain areas. I noticed where I was really low when it came to pay. So I was able to increase my budget when it came to um, employee salaries. So you need to kind of look back at where you were to see where it is that you feel like you can increase or decrease. Keep your eyes on your budget. Look at it weekly, monthly, and of course, um, mid-year so that you can see where you are to make sure you have enough um, funds in different areas, especially when it comes to um, product and uh, food purchases. That's where you're gonna spend a lot of your money is within food purchases. So make sure that everything is in line um, with your budget in regards to food purchases, salaries, and things of that nature.